Hey channel, Fernando from Sky High Audio. Today I'm going to do the third video on a series that I started a few weeks back called um, If You Find This, Bye Bye Bye. Uh, those videos seem to have gotten quite a bit of attention and following, so I'm going to do a, a third one. So I scoured the shop looking for something special. And by special, it doesn't have to be expensive, and it doesn't have to be exotic, and it doesn't have to be rare. It just has to be a product that's sort of like goes a little bit above and beyond what you'd expect from it. So I tend to pick things that are surprising and engaging. And this is certainly one of them. Uh, this is a Sony E80ES from the 1980s. And it is far different from any other preamplifier they made in this series or in this generation or even within a decade. It's easy to mistake this for other Sonys because they've all had a very similar look. And it wasn't until I looked inside that I realized that this preamp was special and different from the rest. It has a traditional Sony ES look. So we've got the typical rosewood side panels, aluminum extruded faceplate, you know, knobs, mostly plastic. Um, so on the, on the outside, it looks just like any other Sony preamp from this period, which really were not stellar or anything from it. But this one on the inside, tells you a different story. And I'll go a little bit more in depth on this as the video goes on. It's gonna be out about 15 minutes or so. Um, before we jump in, if, you, uh, if you're a fan of the channel, please like and subscribe. It helps keep things you know, hopping and going. I really appreciate your time, uh, your patience, and I love comments. I, I, I try to remember to tell people, like, I respond 100% of the comments. So if you take the time and leave me a question about this preamp or something else you've seen in our shop, or a comment, or even mistakes. I make tons of them in these videos. I don't edit. I kind of wing it, as you can tell. So if I got anything wrong, please let me know so that uh, other users and, and viewers get the same information. So hang on, it's gonna be up 15 minutes. I'm gonna jump right in. So one of the immediate confirmations that I get that I've found something special is if I can find the model listed in the vintage knob, these guys have done an amazing job vintageknob.org at curating essentially what I'm doing here, you know, finding the best of the best and writing up, doing a, a bit about them. And he, sure enough, Sony TA E80ES is here in the vintage knob. And right off the bat, you can see, which I had no idea, they've got a champagne gold version. Look how cool that is. Even the end plates look slightly different. Um, so this preamp was available in two finishes. They show a picture of the inside, which I'm gonna do as well. And they talk about its history, where it came from, you know, the successor to it. And um, they did really do a great, great job with it. So the first thing uh, to note on this is where it sat in its lineup. So the E80S also had a matching amplifier that went with it, which was the N80ES. Its sibling amplifier, also beautifully built, very similar look, which obviously was meant to stack together with this piece. So if you end up getting one of these, do in fact try to find the matching amplifier, the TAN80ES. All right. Its predecessor was the TAE77 ESD, which looks cool as well, but it is not anything like this. It is well built, but they were messing around with digital processing at that point at Sony. So it's not a real analog audiophile preamp like the E80ES is. Uh, another couple of things worth noting, this has an amazing phono section and the uh, loading is available from the front, which I always love. I hate fiddling around inside of a machine or in the back to mess around with the cartridge loading. So kudos to Sony for putting in the right place. Um, looking inside, right off the bat, you can tell um, how well built this is. And mostly the, the layout and the attention to detail. If you look at a preamp from the 90s from Sony, there's gonna be a mess of wires flying through here. It's gonna be three, four times the parts count. It's gonna be crappy capacitors. It's gonna have questionable PC boards and a bunch of other things that are not worth the effort, but not on this one. You can see they took some incredible care on laying out the things. And that's what's most notable about this preamp is positioning, for example. Um, power supply is over on the left side as it is with many other Sony components. You've got the transformer a little bit further forward. You've got the first stage of the uh, power supply here with two massive Nichicon uh, 10,000 microfarad capacitors. Look at these beautiful things. 
that's a great sign of, of quality and uh, they're, they're quite quite expensive so for Sony to have included them in this preamp is means that they were really trying hard uh, the boards you can see this like sort of green coloration that's a glass epoxy board uh, which is very very high quality even used uh, today and then the cabling layout it's all very very logically laid out very carefully you can see it follows specific paths so that it doesn't pick up interference as it goes along so we've got the power supply here on the far side we've got the phono section on its own little PC board which I love to see this is the most delicate piece in terms of placement the moving coil section of a phono preamp is very susceptible to interference so in this particular case they put it on its own board and to activate it they've used a a long cable tied to the front so as I play around with the cartridge loading it actually is cable actuated and it uh, offsets the, the switch which is located right here so rather than move and send the signal all the way to the front panel they actually leave the signal condensed in the back and they actuate the switch remotely which is what we want to see in a preamp of this level here are the driver boards for the left and right channels, so you can see it's almost a dual mono design. Not entirely because it's sharing a power supply, but I'm willing to bet this is probably a left channel and a right channel right there for the gain stages. And then this board here is for the switching. And this is where things get very, very interesting. So in the front, we've got an input selector. And the first thing I notice is that as you spin the input selector, there are no markings on this knob. This knob is entirely free of any markings, LEDs, or anything like that, but the input selector switches along in a linear fashion. So I'm on tape two right now. If I do it again, tape three, auxiliary CD, tuner, and phono. The other thing I notice is as soon as I switch, I hear a relay click twice, once to disengage and once to engage. And I'll talk about that in a second. And then it also jumps from phono all the way back to tape, so it's in a continuous loop. So it's not indexed in any way. So what's happening is, as soon as this rotary selector, which is really what it is, it's only sending a signal, this rotary selector notices a change of input, it mutes the outputs, and then it tells this motor here to spin to a specific location because all the switching is done inside of this box right here. This is a super high quality, um, essentially, switch selector. It's a rotary switch. So let me do it and see if we can pick up on the noise. I look over on this side, I can actually see that the motor is spinning. I don't know if you're going to be able to pick that up, but you can kind of see the, yeah, specifically here, you see the screw turn right here. So it's indexing to the appropriate location. So this one is another, it's another. That one went half a rotation almost, and this one went back. So they're not even in order, which is absolutely interesting. So it's essentially a computer control. It's got some logic in there to tell this potentiometer group uh, where to switch. So that's important because we also want to keep the signal paths to the back of the unit. If we've got inputs here and outputs just to the left of them, we don't want that signal to travel all the way to the front of the unit as it would have happened on vintage preamps. So really, really cool way of doing it. I've seen other Sony pieces where instead of running a motor, which is rather complex, they actually, for example, they mount the input selector right here in the front. They'll run a carbon fiber shaft all the way to this rotary and allow you to just physically change it. So this is a little more exciting. I imagine they did this because they'd like to be able to remote control the input selector as well. So that's what we've got here. At the top, we've got the XLR board uh, for converting uh, XLR to single-ended. Got some, probably some voltage selectors there, some control. A real amazing layout. Now let's talk about the chassis quality. Um, typical extruded aluminum faceplate, but even though these, these knobs look like they're plastic, they're actually not. They're all machined aluminum. And so are these guys right here. These are not plastic knobs in any way. The square buttons are, but the knobs are not. The other thing worth noting is the chassis itself. I don't know if you can get a peek over here, but you can kind of see the sort of honeycomb structure. Not honeycomb in the way that Pioneer did it. This is something else. Let me see what they called it. They call it a J 
Gibraltar chassis and it's almost an inch thick. So it's some sort of composite. Yeah, I don't think it's metal. I think it's some sort of composite stuff that is incredibly thick and rigid. I'm sure it was computer engineered back at the time, which was a big deal back then to be able to design something for rigidity with a computer. If we take a look at the back, there's no evidence of it, but we do see there is a metal plate as well. Actually, two of them. This is really nice. They've given us a little access panel to be able to get to the bottom of the unit. So they were keeping the uh, service technicians in mind, which is nice to see, which we don't see very often. The other super critical important uh, piece in, or component in a preamp is the volume control. And here Sony chose to use uh, uh, ALPS for a four pot uh, volume control made by ALPS, which is motorized here. So we're able to control it from the remote, which is a really nice feature. Lastly, look at these bus bars that they use to carry. I imagine it's uh, the ground. Um, they use here almost a half inch copper bus bar essentially joining these two boards together. And then they use a smaller version here um, between the left and right channels. All right, let's move on to some of the functions. Let's look at the front panel from front to back. I'm sorry, from left to right. So we've got a standard a power button here, pretty simple affair. We've covered the input selector. We've got some headphones here with the gold plated uh, quarter inch jack, which is really nice. And we're able to turn the output on and off, which is also a nice feature. So we're, we can actually leave the headphones plugged in and just disengage them by uh, turning off the output from the preamp. Or you could listen to headphones and the amplifier at the same time. Not sure where you'd want to do that, but I like that better than having to remove the headphones every single time we want to use them because that ends up wearing out the headphone jack. All right, up top, we've got the input. So we talked about, let's talk about the treble and bass controls. Um, you know, it's, it's been debatable whether a high quality two channel audio file grade preamp should have bass and treble controls. I like them, especially if I'm running vintage speakers. But for those that don't like it, they've given us a source direct button that entirely bypasses the tone controls and the filters as well. So nice, nice feature there. We've got the ability to change the turnover. We've got 200 hertz and 400 for the bass knob, and we've got 6K and 3K as your set points for the treble. So this entire section here is tone control. Moving on here, we've got the record out selector. I like to see this because we deal with a lot of tape decks and reel to reel especially in vintage systems. So this allows us to select what we want to output to the tape loop. Cartridge loading, again, this is nice not to have it all the way in the back. We've got two loadings for moving coil and then moving magnet. A very simple balanced knob. Stereo and mono switch and then subsonic this is for reducing uh, turntable or eliminating turntable rumble and muting which mutes by 20 dbs negative 20 dbs rather than muting completely which i also like because it keeps people from blasting without realizing if you have a conventional mute that completely kills the signal and someone leaves the channel all the way up and you remove the mute you can often blow it out so I like it to just mute to minus 20 dBs, which is perfect. Not much else. We see the model designation here in this corner. All right, taking a look at the back of the unit, and this is where things get a little bit more special. And um, first and foremost, we've got uh, a set of balanced inputs and a set of balanced output. Highly, highly unusual for Sony in this era. I think the CD player that I reviewed recently had a set of balanced outputs. Even some of the really high-end amplifiers didn't have uh, balanced inputs uh, in this era. So this is really the, the one-two punch for this particular model. The fact that we've got a, not just a set of outputs, but also a set of inputs. Um, and I'll start with that. This is assigned to the CD player. And we've got a switch here to choose between the XLR and the single ender, which sits right here. And for outputs, we've got three, which is a really nice thing to see. We've got. Uh, two sets of uh, RCAs and a set of balanced as well with a coding here as to how we'd want to assign the, the pinout. I'm going to go back to the left. Phono section right here aligned with the card just above it. Makes complete sense. 
So understand that even though we are able to do moving coil and moving magnet, there's only facilities for one hookup, so you get to choose. Some of the older preamps actually had a moving coil separately from a moving magnet input, but in this particular case, we're limited to one turntable. Okay, we've got an adapter here. I think this is probably a tape loop. I saw a button in the front that I didn't cover before, but I suspect that button is essentially to send this out to an equalizer. All right, we've got tuner CD and auxiliary. And check this out, three tape loops. Absolute madness. So maybe, uh, wow, even if you had a dual cassette deck, you wouldn't need this many. So I don't know, maybe a cassette deck for one, a DAT player for the second, and a reel-to-reel -reel for the third one. I'm not quite sure, but that's very generous of them. Uh, control, this is to link the two, uh, several Sony pieces together from this era. And the uh, three uh, outlets, which are all switched. This allows you to turn on off other devices connected to this input. Well, I meant to ask, if you guys know what this Gibraltar stuff is made out of, uh, please let me know in the comments. Um, we're debating here. I tapped on it a little bit with the screwdriver. Doesn't feel metallic, doesn't sound metallic, feels composite. Might be cast aluminum, might be some sort of plastic. I'd love to know it if you guys know. All right, feeding a 1K uh, signal through it. You see on the display on the scope, pretty clean throughout its volume range. And then we switch over to a square wave to see the influence of the tone controls on it. So I'm gonna play with the, the tone controls and show you the effect on it. So this is increasing and decreasing the bass. And this is the treble itself. Now if I hit the bypass button, there you go, back to absolute baseline. So this is essentially the bypass function. Tone controls enabled, tone controls, tone controls disabled. Now for the subsonic, So sonic enabled, subsonic disabled, and if I bypass, oops, the subsonic is also out of the signal path, which is nice. One last thing on the build quality. I just noticed as I was putting the cover back on, this thing's got to weigh at least five, six pounds. It appears to be a two or three millimeter uh, solid steel uh, cover. Uh, just finishing up the entire great build quality of this of this Sony piece. So there you have it, the E80ES. If you find one of these at a flea market, a pawn shop, your favorite store, do grab it. I, I assure you will be pleased by its performance, its features and qualities. I don't have the remote for this one. I'm going to have to see if I can find it because I do see an IR input right here and that would really complete this nicely. I have matching systems. I actually did a review on a full ES system from this era that I sliced together. I'll put a link below for you and check this out. I've got a CD player here that would actually go brilliantly with it. This is the X777ES, very similar to the one that I reviewed a few weeks ago that did so well. I had it in champagne finish. I've got one here now in black. I think this one needs service though. So, oh, and maybe this remote. I'll have to check this out and see maybe this one can control the, the preamp, although I don't see volume control. Bummer. So that covers it, guys. Thanks so much for watching. I appreciate your support, your likes, your subscribes, your feedback, all of it. Uh, Fernando from SkyFi Audio. Follow us online at skyfiaudio.com. Thank you.